friends. Welcome to episode 61 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 13th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and my listener comments are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast is something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Julie in Germany, Rachel in Indiana, Rhonda in Illinois, and Heather in North Carolina. I was thrilled to open my email this week and find a wonderful message from Penny in New Zealand. I asked, and Penny said I could read her email aloud. She wrote, Hi, Amy. I just wanted to email to say a massive thank you for your podcast, which I discovered over the summer here in New Zealand. I have binge listened to the whole series while walking, and I am now going back to the start and re-listening to each podcast and making notes and checking out the attached notes and links for all podcasts. Holy moly, what an amazing resource. This could quite honestly be my PD for the entire year, and it's free, which will keep our PD budget holder happy. Parentheses, who happens to be my husband, and parentheses. And this is Amy just jumping in here. Penny, you are absolutely not alone. So many listeners I talk to oftentimes find themselves funding their own uh, conferences and travel expenses and hotel. Last summer, when I went to the ISTE conference in Philadelphia, my birthday present to myself was airfare and the hotel because my district wasn't paying for that. And it was something I chose to go to. So you're not alone in that respect. In fact, I have been made aware of at least one district in Texas which uses my podcast as PD, and the school librarians are encouraged to listen, and then it becomes part of the focus of a discussion afterwards. So why not take advantage of some a resource which is free and available and customizable? Which, by the way, happens to be my ALA presentation that I'm working on for this June. Back to Penny and her lovely letter. So she says, quote, What I really love is that as I listen, I am doing a couple things. One, I'm going, oh my God, in my head, this woman has surely been spying on our library. There are many things which I can relate to, and it makes me feel so much better to know I'm not the only one. I am doing some things right. I am experiencing the same issues as you. I am very lucky to have the job I do. Number two, I am hurriedly sending myself emails with ideas I could use in our library. I am seriously going to walk into a lamppost soon. Honestly, I have nicked so many good ideas that they will keep me going for years. And this is Amy jumping in. Um, Penny, it's not stealing. It's using great ideas and applying them to your own personal library program. And we do that all the time. And it is one of the reasons why season two requires that we bring in experts because at some point I've exhausted my bank of expertise and knowledge and experience and having other people con- and con- contribute to the conversation makes this podcast valuable on a completely different level. Going back to Penny's lovely letter. When I realized that there is so much for me to learn, I decided that I would do the whole re-listening thing and make uh, notes so I can get as much out of the podcast as I can. I've also got a list of podcasts to listen to, which will keep me going for years. Thank you so much for having the courage to start your podcast. It has been and will continue to be a complete game changer for me. And it has come at just the right time in my library journey. Parentheses. I am starting my fifth year as a school librarian, so I have had enough time to get to know the job and feel ready to take on more. End parentheses. Penny, you made my day. You made my week. You made my month. And Penny, I would like to assure you that I will continue to create more and more episodes and 
thankfully, that has been made very easy by the generosity of so many library professionals, because when I ask them if they'd like to be featured on the podcast, they all say yes. So I promise you, we will continue to have more podcast episodes. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions and guest suggestions. Recently, that's been really fantastic. Either on Facebook, Twitter, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include a mailing address and your school address is fine, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now for today's episode, let's stop literacy shaming and my interview with Stephen Tatro. Before I jump into the interview, I wanted to revisit an essay which has found its way into several podcast episodes of mine, Annie Ward's The Nutritional Value of Dessert Books. I've included a link in the show notes. Annie writes, quote, I have been pondering the dessert book metaphor. It hinges on the presumption that some books, like their confectionery counterparts, lack nutritional value. If you enjoy them too much, they mustn't be good for you. The author continues, Quote, it seems to me that the healthiest approach to the conundrum of how closely to regulate a child's independent reading diet is to adopt an inquiry stance around his or her selections. Rather than act as a book warden, dismissing or postponing children's choices out of the gate, why not kid watch, confer, and respectfully probe before assuming a book has limited nutritional value? Annie Ward concludes that the books which inspire curiosity and foster a love of reading and new knowledge in our students makes whatever book a child reads worthwhile. And this is worth noting that very early in this podcast existence, I recorded a pair of episodes, number four, Book Warden, and number five, Book Snob. And in both, I reflect on how, as a school librarian, sometimes I have been known to take on both of those roles. And now, my interview with Stephen Tatro. Listeners, I am so excited today to be sharing with you a conversation I am been looking forward to having with Steve Tatro. And uh, for those of you who see him on Twitter, uh, he has, uh, you'll find yourself agreeing with all the things he has to say and share. So, uh, and I, I've also encountered uh, Steve and a lot of his writing on Knowledge Quest, but I'm, I'm excited to bring him here tonight and, uh, and share our conversation with you about ending literacy shaming. So welcome to the podcast, Steve Tatro. Thank you so much. I am really excited to be here. I mean, I've loved listening to your podcast over the past uh, several months when I first encountered it. And it's just, you've always got the most interesting ideas and people coming through. So I'm really honored that uh, you wanted to chat about this. Well, I made a promise to myself that uh, this podcast would always be for school librarians, by school librarians. And if I put us on a pedestal, it's because I happen to think we have a, a lot to share and a lot of people who benefit from us. And the job that we do. I want to start off by asking you about your Twitter bio because um, you describe yourself as more degrees than a thermometer. It says to me you are a lifelong learner, which many of us would describe us. Uh, Tell us about your journey to becoming a school librarian. It has been a real long and winding road, I'll tell you. Um, That line, more degrees than a thermometer, is actually my dad's. Uh, He bestowed that on me after I got my um, doctorate. Um, I actually started out in the classroom and, uh, you know, English teacher for a couple of years. And then a couple of friends got and I got together and said, you know, we're reaching maybe 100 kids, 150 kids a year in our classrooms. We really want to do more than that. So let's go become administrators and like run schools and then we can, you know, reach everybody. So we went, we did that. We got those degrees, um, ended up with the masters. <laughs> you, you do make it sound easy. I, I think well, you just <laughs> waved your magic wand. Um, I, it did represent a great deal of, of, uh, your life as, as an educator becoming a, an administrator. So, um, let's not diminish that commitment. I'm awfully glad that you decided to become a school librarian. Um, I can be honest in saying there is no part of me that would ever have made an effective administrator. So you do yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> well, well, that was the thing, though. We got through the, the degrees and a couple of my friends went into administration. I was kind of still on the fence about whether I wanted to do it. So rather than leaving the classroom, I stayed there. Um, and then I happened to fill in for our librarian in my in my middle school for a couple of weeks when he was out during my prep periods. I was able to go in and run the library and I was like, 
I this is what I miss about learning. Like this is what I miss about um, education is it's you've got these kids that come in looking for stuff that's going to fulfill their interests and their needs. And it's not about are they going to pass a test? Are they, you know, making it to a certain grade? Like it's just they're coming in interested in learning. And I was like, that's what I want. So I, I jumped back into learn and went back to Rutgers. I spent 17 years, I figured out the other day, 17 years of Rutgers altogether cr- across the degrees. So uh, went back and I got the degree and now I was all excited to jump back into um, being a school librarian. I feel like libraries are where education happens these days. When I got my job, I'd already been teaching for about 15 years. I, I will never leave my library. And while my jobs may change, um, my role in the school, I I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, I'm sure listeners recognize you from Knowledge Knowledge Quest. And um, my guess is that as a contributor to Knowledge Quest, your many, many years as a classroom educator has shaped your perspectives when you consider the role of the school librarian. Oh, absolutely. I mean, being in a classroom and seeing, um, as an English teacher for 20 years, you know, I, I've been dealing a lot with kids reading and especially with like the required sorts of reading that you really, some of it gets forced down kids' throats and, you know, getting to think about how I approach that and how do I engage those students in the classroom, um, and considering how, some of those techniques would be applied in the library instead, you know, ways to engage students and make them feel like they want to be there instead of feeling like they have to be there. You know, and the library is a little bit of a different animal because that's really a lot of times the kids are sort of self-selecting to come to the library. But I also feel like there's so many learning opportunities in the library that can be easily missed if you're not sort of thinking about how can I bring like a learning situation to the kids? How can I take advantage of those learning moments when they're there, especially when they are just self-select and come in? Um, so I, I definitely, you know, there's always that idea of how do I help them learn what is going to help them? So you are a classroom teacher. You mm-hmm. teach, uh, you're an English teacher. What English do you teach? <laughs> so this year I've only got seventh graders and it's actually kind of interesting because they created a, they, they decided they wanted to make a new class last year for the seventh graders to take. And they called it argument and debate. And they said, do you want to write this and maybe teach it? And I said, sure, why not? So I basically turned argument and debate into the class I would teach if I was the librarian at the school. It's got research skills. It's got media, um, info literacy skills, Um, they do some public speaking as well, but like I've tried to build it into a program that would give them a lot of the stuff that they are not able to get, um, with, you know, some of the problems we've had with the library. So it's been, uh, I've really enjoyed it. The kids seem to really be enjoying it. Um, and the kids that have all the seventh graders cycle through it, they get one marking period of it. And the kids who have been through it so far, their teachers are coming back with some really good feedback, which has been great about how the kids are talking about how to find reliable resources and they're talking about how to cite their sources correctly. And I'm like, thank goodness some of it's sinking in. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, I think in the, the fun thing here is it sounds like you were able to have a lot of flexibility with your curriculum. Yes. And uh, as somebody who has sat in and is currently sitting in on curriculum meetings, um, that is oftentimes not greeted with a great deal of enthusiasm because in some cases you feel like you're reinventing the wheel, but you saw this as an opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. As soon as they gave me the option to write this, I was like, okay, my mind just immediately went to, if you're going to talk about debate, you've got to have good information. So we're talking research and we're talking how to make sure that they're doing that right. Because that was such a huge part of, um, even just as an English teacher, that's a huge part. But when I went through the MLIS program, you know, one of the main things we talked about was information literacy and how lacking it is. And it was funny because as an English teacher, I hadn't really thought about that side of things very much. And the library classes that I took really opened up my eyes to so many things that were blindingly obvious once they'd been pointed out, but that as an English teacher just never crossed my radar because I was focused on my curricular stuff and not thinking about some of these bigger picture issues. Wow, that's great. I I guess I feel, I mean, how lucky for your students, uh, you know, to have a librarian teaching them. And also you sort of see that which those of us on a fixed schedule see because we can see that growth over time uh, Mm -hmm. when we see our students regularly and we can see how 
how the lessons that we introduce to them, say at the beginning of the year, are building and uh, and 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 it's very rewarding. So I guess uh, you you've been able to see um, you know all the good that comes from this opportunity. Absolutely. bring you on the podcast because an article you wrote really stopped me in my tracks and it, it's a knowledge quest posted on March 8th, 2019 titled Stop Literacy Shaming, Engaging the So-Called Non-Readers. And it sounds like something that you've observed firsthand working in the schools. Oh yeah. It's, and I mean, it's not just something I've observed. It's something that I actually have done in the past. Um, without a doubt, as an English teacher, I have literacy shamed students in the past. And I just, it never occurred to me what I was really doing. Those times when a kid would say, oh, you know, I know we're supposed to read, you know, this for a book report. Can I read this book that's, you know, a hundred pages long? Or can I read this graphic novel? And I'd kind of roll my eyes and just kind of be like, you know, that's not really, that's not what we do in school. Like school reading is supposed to be serious reading. You're supposed to be doing something, you know, more or better. And it's only been fairly recently that I've kind of looked at that behavior and gone like, what were you doing there? Like, why would you make a kid feel bad that they want to read something? That is so insane. So it's really become a major pet peeve of mine now that I've recognized it in myself. You know, we hate the things in others that we see in ourselves. So <laughs> this is this is one of those things that just drives me up the wall. <laughs> well, and, you know, I, I think that there are all, regardless of what you do as an educator, there's always something you realize. I mean, we're very critical of our past practices and the woulda, coulda, shoulda, which yeah. really does tend to haunt me. Um, we have to take that as, you know, moving forward, this is how we are going to um, address this moving forward. And and it is, I think, to your credit, having uh, additional degrees has given you the opportunity to reflect. I think it's uh, very often when people find themselves, uh, I don't want to use the word stuck, but if they don't go and get an additional degree, uh, I don't think they oftentimes have that required reflection piece that that we have to when we're in graduate school and when we are pursuing other avenues related to being an educator because you don't look at what you do very critically and say is this the best my students uh you know is this the best i can give to my students yeah. i um the word non-readers it's such a it's such a toxic uh term um and the word non-readers, it really does, um, as a, as a librarian and an educator, it's really an affront. Um, I've sometimes thought of some of my students during checkout. Um, I might think of them as tough customers or being super picky. Um, I've really tried to never associate the word non-readers. And yet it sounds like somebody's given up on these kids. Do you think that kids self-assign this label or it's something that I mean are we are responsible as educators because adults in these children's lives have communicated this idea that they just don't like to read yeah I mean I think it's just there's a combination of things going on I think because I've had uh, parents and kids come to me and say I've had parents come and say my kid's not a reader my kids my kid just doesn't read and I'll have the kids come and say, after hearing their parents say that, they're like, oh, absolutely. No, I, I hate reading. I don't read. And it's it just it hurts. You know, it hurts that these kids start to internalize that message because it's it's like you said, it's not something that really is true. It's just a a label that they've applied to themselves or heard applied to them. And they've sort of started to take it on. And I think it just comes down to the I mean. You, we always say like you, you, you haven't, you're not a non-reader. You just haven't found that book that you like yet, you know? And until you get to that point, until you've, if, if you're going to tell me you've read every book that exists and you haven't found anything that works for you, okay, maybe you're a non-reader, but <laughs> there's always something out there that's going to grab your interest and pull you in a little bit. 
Well, and I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, kids have to have that that choice. And I know we're going to talk about reader's choice. Um, A conversation I was having with my son, one of my sons, they're they're both 17. And one of my sons was so excited because he finished a book that he got for Christmas. And he had very specifically picked this book out. And uh, he found out about it on Reddit and he's an engineer and he loves uh, 3D printing and he, he, he picked out a book that he really wanted to read. He finished it and he was so excited about it and he showed me his Reddit th- uh, thread where he was bragging about this book that he finished and um, you know to see, and he actually described himself as a non-reader to his followers on on this Reddit thread and it's like hmm. oh my gosh, my son doesn't think he's a reader and <laughs> I, I'm again, I um, this is where as a, as a parent, I'm sitting there going, really, you, you don't think you're a reader. And because oftentimes uh, kids in school, if they're reading for an assignment, that's not considered reading, you know, right. that, yeah. So they're like, well, yeah, I read for school, but that doesn't count. Like, yep. yeah. <laughs> and, and the problem is that the reading that they do in school so often is, assigned reading that they like everybody has to read this book and we're going to pull it apart and we're going to dissect it and we're going to take all the joy out of the process of reading and as we learn how to break this down and look at what's going on in it and there's definitely something to be said for like seeing what the mechanics are of how a book works and how an author works but there's so little time left in so in most curriculums for kids to just enjoy the reading process. So I think you're absolutely right that they just completely disassociate what they're doing in school with reading. Well, and as educators, we are so held accountable for the time we spend with our students that if we uh, have a reading opportunity with our students, we are therefore trying to assign uh, meaning or accountability to that Activity. Well, if you're sitting here reading in class, I have to assign a standard to it, a common Absolutely. core. I have to give there. There has to be something attached to this activity or else it doesn't count. Absolutely. And I and I totally get that's why so many educators kind of push this kind of reading on kids like it there. There is that pressure, just like you're saying. And, you know, test scores and and just all the different accountability measures that are pushed onto teachers, you don't feel like you've got the time and the freedom to help kids just enjoy what they're doing. And it's, I mean, it's completely understandable, but by the same token, if our purpose is to really turn kids into lifelong learners, are we, we're definitely not serving that purpose when we um, focus them only on the breaking it down, dissecting it style of reading and not giving them that chance to really engage and enjoy. Right. And you can, you know, even educators who say, hey, you can pick out whatever book you want to do, but after you're done, you have to write this report. Or after you're done, you have to make a Google slideshow. Or after Mm -hmm. you're done, you need to stand up in front of the class and tell us, you know, in three minutes why they should read this book. And assigning that expectation now changes the context in which the student is is consuming the the reading material. You've now put... Uh, sort of a layer on top of this reading material and said, that's great that you're going to enjoy it, but we still have this thing hanging out here that you have to do. Um, I do want to mention, you know, a lot of times when we talk about not, you know, the term non-readers, um, I'm aware teachers and school librarians tend to look at our readers and sometimes use the softer word of, oh, this is this, this student's a reluctant reader or, you know, challenge accepted, hold my beer, I'm going to figure out what this kid wants to read. And um, I know I'm going to give it what I can when it comes to uh, finding that, uh, you know, whatever it is the student connects with. And, you know, it, it takes time. It doesn't happen instantly. And it takes building relationships with these students. You see them day after day. I see them when they come up for our library visits. Um, when it comes to literacy shaming, um can I, am I correct that this is the idea that not all reading is considered reading? Yes, that is exactly, that's exactly the point. Um, there's so many, like you were saying before, there's so many strictures that we put on the reading, you know, like it has to be a certain length to count, or it has to be a certain level to count, or it's got to be a certain format to count. And uh, again, I used, I do this. I used to do this when I was talking to my students. Like I, I got the idea of, literacy shaming from looking at my own practice in large part. Um, 
because like you were saying, there's that pressure to try and make sure the kids are going to be better readers. You know, we've got to push them. We've got to take them out of their comfort zone. We've got to get them to the next level of reading. And unfortunately, that too often becomes the only reading that kids are exposed to, especially in school. And school reading is often the only reading. So if that's what we're doing, pushing, 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 we take away that chance for them to just enjoy and explore at their own pace. Listeners, I think it's a good time to break. I want to make sure um, I mention this. You know, Steve has put together a great website. His resources are there. And, you know, this is something I have learned from doing the research for this episode, the the passion and sort of this, this campaign that Steve is waging on literacy shaming. And I, I will attach the links to his uh, support material and his website, but I strongly encourage you to go and explore this resource as a school librarian because um, looking at the things that he's put together has really given me a lot of pause. I especially want to just ask you about your PSA that you put together on YouTube. (laughs) Sure. um, Was your intended audience parents, educators, both? Um, I, I watched it and I said, I know a lot of people who need to see this. (laughs) <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Um, it was funny that, I mean, the whole idea of literacy shaming itself actually came from a tweet that I saw where somebody had asked, what's your guilty reading pleasure that you won't tell anybody about? And that got me thinking about like, uh, cause I immediately responded with, oh, the twilight series. Absolutely. Like I never want anybody to know that I read that. And that got me thinking about like, well, why not? And reading, you got to read for just enjoyment. It doesn't matter what you read. Got me thinking about the whole thing. Got me to the point of talk. Um, coining the term literacy shaming in the first place. And then that kind of snowballed into this idea of in a conversation online a little bit. Um, And somebody had said, you know, I wish somebody would, there was a PSA about this kind of a thing because it's such an important topic. I was like, okay, great. So I went and I just, I tried to put one together real quick. And what came out, I feel like was kind of applicable to teachers, librarians, parents, um, you know, anybody who kind of finds themselves in that position of working with kids and trying to encourage them to read. Because so often it's so easy for our own personal preferences and biases to get in the way when we're talking to other people about what they read and what they do. And especially with kids, they're so, they can be so um, sensitive to those kinds of not even comments, just like a roll of the eyes or, you know, the way that you look at them as they talk about something that they like, they can see if you're kind of getting turned off by that. And it can be such a quick way to shut down a kid who might otherwise be pursuing something. So I, in doing that PSA, I I wanted to just try and make it clear, like, Hey, it's okay that you don't like what the kid likes, but don't discourage them from the thing that they are really interested in, you know, like just try and bear that in mind that your preferences and theirs don't have to match for them to enjoy what they're doing. Well, and I, I, I'm, I don't know if Dave Pilkey said this in so many words, but, um, you know, I think the realization that adults need to have is that if they don't like the books, their children are reading, um, that's okay. The books weren't written for adults. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave Pilkey did not write his books for adults. We were not <laughs> meant to enjoy them. And uh, I, uh, Karina Allen uh, said once that, you know, it, it's not, you know, the fact that I didn't necessarily like the book isn't important. The fact is that my students love the books. Mm-hmm. And I have to remind myself that the books aren't written for me. They're written for the, the, the children, the students that I work with. And you, you you bring up a really good point because um, when you talk about guilty pleasures, because adults, I found, um, especially uh, those of us who do read for fun, oftentimes can hide what we're reading from mm. uh, inquiring minds. I've, I've even seen uh, articles about this, uh, people who watch readers on the subway, but they can't tell any longer what other people are reading. Um, <laughs> you used to be able to strike up a conversation with uh, perfect strangers because you'd see what the, the cover of the book they were reading. And all too often now, adults travel and use e-readers. Mm-hmm. So we We've lost that ability to connect rather spontaneously about the book they're reading, but they can also hide their Fifty Shades of Grey, right. their, their Harlequin romance. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, my first roommate out of college was a voracious reader of Harlequin romance, and I'm going to tell you right now, I 
felt that the fact I didn't read anything was still better than somebody who spent her time <laughs> reading smut. And <laughs> and again, literacy shaming. Exactly. I mean, she was uh, she was having the most wonderful time delving into these books. And how dare I look at this experience and say, well, at least I'm not reading that. Right. You know? right. No, <laughs> so, and I think that's something that we all do so much like, and we don't even realize we're doing it sometimes, you know, like there's this idea that if you're, if you're a real reader, then you have to read serious books. You know, there's only certain kinds of things that you read if you're a real reader. And it's, it's silly when you stop and think about it in those terms, but we, there's so much of that that we've just internalized that we we don't think about it. We don't stop and think about it. And that's why I think this literacy shaming idea is something that we just need to stop and, and think, what are we doing a little bit? And we might realize, ooh, you know, I just didn't even think about how that, what I was doing there or what I was saying there might affect how students see themselves. Well, and you, you sort of hinted at this earlier. You said, you know, how we respond to a child's choice is so important because, um, you know, the students do oftentimes, I notice, carry their books around like an accessory. They Mm. want people to see, look at the book I checked out. Um, And I know some students who would want to read books that might be considered a little too young for them, but they don't want to be judged by their peers. Mm -hmm. And, And sometimes I'll say, look, you know, those picture books, you can read them. Why don't you go over there and read them? You know, if you want to check out other books, but you still want to know what that book is about, go over, have a seat, read it. You don't have to check the book out, but you're certainly welcome to read those books while you're here. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's such a huge point. Like so much of reading, especially for the younger grades is social. You know, it's kids are really good at noticing how adults react to what their peers are doing. So the teacher behavior toward the reading influences how the kids are going to react. And then, you know, the, t- the when the teachers are focused on levels and lengths and the arbiters of what's good reading, that's what the kids start to judge themselves and others by. And that's when you get exactly what you're talking about, where they don't want to be seen with certain books because it's just not. It's not good reading to have those kinds of books. Well, and I've heard, unfortunately, and I would like to hear your take on this as an educator in the classroom, because I have heard educators who sort of console themselves by saying, hey, it's okay if you want to check out that graphic novel, but it's not coming in the classroom. Or Mm -hmm. it's okay that you check out that graphic novel, but you have to pick something else out for your book report. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. the message you're sending is clear. The kids get it. That one book is better than the other and their graphic novel isn't considered legit by the classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. And and all of a sudden, the joy that they have in reading for something is sort of tinged by, it's sort of tainted because Mm -hmm. their teacher has said, that book isn't good enough for the assignment I'm giving you. Yep. That's, and, that's not a real book. Yep. And, and unfortunately, that message is oftentimes echoed at home because I get those emails more, more accurately. The teachers get the emails and then they send them to me because, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I, I want to shift and talk a little bit about the parents role. But I did remember why I wanted to ask you mm-hmm. when your campaign of literacy shaming. It's an awkward conversation as a librarian. Do you find that you have a way to have this conversation with your peers because you're a classroom teacher as opposed to, say, something, uh, you know, uh, you know, the librarian who's in her library and, you know, uh, passing judgment on on these classroom teachers? It is. I mean, it's really not an easy thing to it, it kind of depends, I think, on the relationship you have with whoever you're talking to it about. Um, I always try to point out that, look, this can be a very nobody thinks that they are hurting their kids reading. No teacher, no educator is going to say, oh, yeah, absolutely. I have harmed how my children perceive their reading abilities. That's not that's not what we do. And that's not what we're there for. But it's this that's that's the problem with literacy shaming is it's such an insidious under the radar sort of a thing like a lot of times we don't even realize it so i will when i bring it up i often bring it up as look this is something that i did and only it's only when i pause and say wait a minute what i did there was not the right thing it's only with that reflection like you were mentioning before that i was able to look back and say ooh yeah, that's not the best way to do this. And trying to learn from our mistakes and move forward with it and point out just repeatedly over and over and over to everybody, to parents, to teachers, to librarians, it doesn't matter what kids read as long as they read. 
that's the that's the most important part. Let them read whatever they want to read. Yeah, no, I I, I love that, and I, I will say there's something that I need to acknowledge more, and I don't. But a lot of times, kids will bring a library book. I'm just realizing this now. I'm having this conversation with you. Kids will bring the library. The, I'm sorry, beg your pardon. Kids will bring their own book to the library, and I look at it and say, "Why did you bring your own book to the library?" And they're like, "Oh, I wanted to show it to you," and I was like. Oh, Mrs. Herman, this is the book that I'm reading at home. This is, and I, I, you know, I don't recognize what a special moment that is because the student has chosen to bring a library book from home to the library, show the library, and this is what I'm reading. And I need to recognize that as more of a, of a wow moment. Um, because you're right. I mean, when the kids are getting these messages, um, and, you know, we still are succeeding in putting books in their hands. I mean, that's that's really powerful. Um, I want to talk about parents' role in this um, because we all, <laughs> it's sometimes the toughest part of my job is dealing with the parents, not dealing with the students, <laughs> not dealing with my, my diminishing budget. It's dealing with the parents. <laughs> so, um, you know, parents' role in literacy shaming and the idea that parents somehow um, insist that their kids read the qua- the. The classics. And for me, I hear the word quality. You know, they don't say classics. They say, I want my kids to read quality books. And, um, and you know, we just had the, the YMAs. I mean, I do buy the books with the shiny, shiny awards on them because that is a, a, you know, a nice guarantee to any parent who sees that book walk in the door. Oh, Mrs. Herman has the new Caldecott's, the new Newberries, the, all of the awards that were uh, given out uh, a week ago. And, it sort of is that, you know, the parents can sort of say, oh, good, Mrs. Herman's got some quality books in her library. Hmm. I mean, no, absolutely. I mean, we all do that. We want to convey that legitimacy on our collections, even though we know what matters isn't the awards that it wins. It's about what's the right book for the for the kid. Um, without a doubt, there are better and worse pieces of literature. Like we all know that, but we all have our preferences and we all have our biases And if we limit a collection or if we try and limit a kid to only the quote unquote great works, that's a great way to undermine the student's interest in reading. Right. Yeah. You know? No. And I, I. And I will be honest. And I. I. This is an unpopular view, but um, I think we've all read an award winner, and we sort of scratched our heads and said, "Really? Oh yeah, <laughs> all the time, all the time." <laughs> I. I. Um. I think there was a time in my li- early library career. I sort of said to myself, "I should read." All the Newberry uh, honors and all the Newberry medal winners, and mm. um, uh, it's not only ambitious; um, it's sometimes not as uh, rewarding as one might uh, yeah. think it think it to be. Yeah. Although I am going to say that one of the one of the great things that I was so excited about was that New Kid mm-hmm. took home some honors because now we've. I mean, if you want to convey legitimacy by awards, now we've got a graphic novel that we can say, look, this is something that is recognized as a great piece of literature. L- graphic novels are not some other like they're not kids' books. They're they're for everybody, and they can win awards because they are good. So that was such a wonderful moment when um, Jerry Craft won that award. I was so glad for that. Well, and you when you consider the the award itself will give this particular piece of book uh, this p- piece of literature a, a place in a children's literature history it will uh, this isn't going to fade quietly in and become a book that 10 years from now isn't read um, many of the the award winners have lasted for decades and continue to have strong readership because they were award winners. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just a message we're getting today. It's going to be there tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And, um, you know, I was just so lucky I got a copy of New Kid before it won, because right now my friends who are trying to get it (laughs) from the publishers with the gold sticker on it, um, they're going to find themselves uh, out of stock. Mm -hmm. Um, And and as librarians, (laughs) that has been a trick is when you want to buy those those award winners and uh, and your publishers are out of stock. I wanted to ask you, um, how would you suggest librarians respond to 
parents when, and, and I know you do this as an educator, when, when parents um, impose their values and say, you know, my child is better than this. My child needs to be reading real books. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you artfully and with some sort of diplomacy respond in a way that is both reassuring, but also conveys this idea that reading is reading is reading. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's one of my fallbacks is all reading is good reading. And the more reading the kid is doing, the better they're going to do. You know, Um, I think it's incredibly important for all educators to remind parents that kids who like to read are going to read way more than kids who are forced to read. And Kids are like, uh, they're building lifelong habits. Do you want those habits to be picking up a book or do you want those habits to be avoiding a book? You know, there's always going to be the complaint that the kid is always reading the same kind of thing or even the same book over and over and over again. But so what? If they're reading, that's the important thing. And guess what? Kids sometimes fixate, but they also move on to their next fixation. So give them time and they'll move on to the next thing on their own. You know, and I know it's hard to have that patience, especially when you want to see something different or you want to see a change. But for kids especially, I, I, I try and reinforce every time I can to parents, like, let them find their thing because they will find it. And if they're doing it out of their own interest, they're going to go so much further than if you are trying to force them into doing something they don't want to do. Well, and I, I want to, um, I, I didn't uh, mention this before, but, you know, uh, from myself, my own preference is audiobooks. And mm. we have a, a lovely opportunity to introduce our students to audiobooks, uh, if not through your own library collection, through your local community library. Mm-hmm. Your community library, I've oftentimes relied on our community uh, network because they have such a robust collection, but they also have an amazing digital collection. And so our students can get, uh, I think it's up to 10 checkouts uh, at a time. And then our li- our public library is affiliated through Hoopla. So that's, nice. that's another uh, way to get kids excited and um, bringing, you know, I think there is some literacy shaming that uh, and that some people feel audiobooks don't count or, oh, they, absolutely. Count, or they count less. Mm-hmm. And uh, as somebody who would listen to a book before I would read it, just because of where I am professionally and and mm-hmm. as somebody who has uh, a lar- you know, family I'm still taking care of, I have a lot of uh, things that keep me from sitting down on the couch and reading. So um, I've... It's, there's been I, some really neat research re- late recently about how your brain is engaged the same way by audiobooks as it is by reading text on a page. I saw and that. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's something that I try and point out when people try and say, well, audiobook, it's not the same thing. I'm like, well, to your brain, it pretty much is. So don't try and give me that excuse. <laughs> well, and we have, um, I've, I have been showing some of my students um, uh, e-books. And once they realize the book is not going to read itself to them, mm. they uh, the, the engagement with the screen, these are my video gamers. These are my students who have a relationship with their screen. And they are as absorbed reading the graphic novel on the screen as mm. they are if they were holding the page. I do also have students who say, you know what, Mrs. Herman, I know you like audiobooks and ebooks, but I just have to be able to hold this book. Yeah. And that's coming from like a nine-year-old. So... <laughs> I, I, That's awesome. We, we're succeeding somewhere, you know. Um, I, I do appreciate you, and I wanted to before you go. I, you said something really important in this article, and it was about intrinsic motivation. And I mm. want to quote you, even though you're standing right here. Um, <laughs> quote: The more kids find their motivation coming from their own engagement with and interest in the topic, the more they are going to internalize that knowledge. End quote. And I, I love that because. You're not rewarding them with um, stickers. You're not rewarding them with a visit to the prize box. Mm-hmm. You're not giving them, um, you know, smiley faces on a on a, a sticker chart. Yeah, I mean, it really does. I, that's important. There, that some people feel that if my kid's going to read, I, I've got to somehow do something to to excite them. That that involves uh, something other than just reading the book. I don't see. I I just have a. I have so many problems with that on different levels. The main one being like intrinsic motivation is the main requirement if you want a lifelong learner. You you don't 
become a lifelong learner if you only learn because someone's giving you something, you know? And so there's that. But then there's also the fact that I truly believe that reading is a reward in and of itself. It's kind of like saying, well, I'm, I'll give you – uh, some candy if you go on the Ferris wheel. Like, no, you want to go on the Ferris wheel because it's fun, right? That's reading is fun. I, I shouldn't have to get something in addition to that. So <laughs> did you, when you were in school, did you know anybody who got paid for their grades? Um, cause I did. I don't know if I did. Not off I was the top appalled. of my head. I was appalled. <laughs> I, was, I was like, wait, let me get this straight. And this was in high school. And um, they said, oh, yeah, my grandma pays me for every A I get. And my parents pay me for every A I get. Mm. And I'm just sitting there scratching my head. And yeah. I, I don't think I even asked my parents because I knew it wouldn't fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, that doesn't that doesn't seem to make any sense. No. Um, and I wanted to say, you you also, I feel silly quoting you because you're right here. And you said, let's help our students see themselves as readers. And, you know, I think that there's so much that educators in general can do to validate our students. Um, you know, can you tell me how do we empower readers to see themselves as readers? Um, I think a big part of it is just acknowledging that the choices they're making to read are important choices for them. And, you know, uh, doing the opposite of literacy shaming, you know, praising the fact that a kid is reading a book, whatever that book might be. Um, but I'm also so into the idea of students having input into collections and collection development. You know, I can't wait for the day that I get to take over a school library because I, the first thing I'm going to do is put together a poll and ask the students, what are the books that you want to see? What are the books that you like? What are the books that we should be bringing into this school so that you and your peers can enjoy them? Because that's when they have a stake in making the reading collection they have, they know that reading is valued, that their reading is valued, that their opinions are valued. And that's what's going to make them really see themselves as readers. All right. So readers, so, so listeners, if any of you are out there and you happen to have a great angle on student voice in your collection, um, I have a few people in mind, but I got to tell you, I would love to do an episode on student voice in the library. And I, I think that that, that is going to be its own episode. Um, you have been an absolute delight. Um, before we say good night, um, you know, you are your your message is very clear and you're very passionate about this these your ideas i listeners i i really encourage you to take a look um when you see the materials that Stevens put together and, and when you see his name pop up in uh, knowledge quest, because it really his writing is very uh powerful as well so i, I Anything else you want to convey to our listeners before uh, before I, I, I ask you about your, your uh, social media and where we can follow you? Uh, I mean, it's just been so great to be able, be able to have a chance to talk about this issue because it's something, like I said, that can fly under the radar so easily. So I'm really glad that I, I was just so overjoyed when you said, oh, this is something I'd really like to talk to you about because – um, I know that your listeners are really thoughtful people and are going to really take this to heart and help, you know, kind of spread the message of getting kids the recognition they deserve for the reading that they're doing. Wow. It, I really appreciate the time you've taken out. I know it's a school night. Um, wow. Tell us where our listeners can find you on social media. Um, I'm on Twitter at um, Dr. T Loves Books. That's D-R-T Loves Books. Um, and that's where I do most of my communicating. And uh, my website, drsteevet.com, um, is where I try to post articles. And uh, the PSA is there. I'm gonna. I'm trying to work on a couple new PSAs, so we'll keep our fingers crossed on some more uh, literacy shaming PSAs out there. Outstanding. And, uh, that's where you can find me. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I look for good things to come, and I can't wait for our paths to cross in the future. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to extend a special thank you again to Stephen, whose perspectives made contemplating our role in stopping literacy shaming all the more meaningful. Please be sure to visit the show notes as there are many links to terrific articles, websites, and online resources, including Annie Ward's Nutritional Value of Dessert Books, Public Service Announcements, and there are three of them created by Stephen Tatro, one on genre and, letter and level, the second one is on adult expectations, and the third one is on boy books versus girl books. There's also a link to Stephen Tatro's website, his Knowledge Quest article, Stop Literacy Shaming, 
as well as a school library connection article called End Literacy Shaming. As you know, listener feedback and episode suggestions are very important as it helps give this podcast direction and drives upcoming episodes. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out on Facebook, Twitter, and the email address School Librarians United. If you enjoyed listening to today's episode, consider sharing it on social media as it helps other listeners find this podcast. The topic of our next episode will be my Newberry experience and my interview with return guest Casey Boyd, who will share with listeners her experiences this year serving on the Newberry Committee. I hope you will tune in.